Thank you for following us to our next lecture for point of care ultrasound, this time of the upper extremity looking for venous thrombosis. We're going to get right into this. There's going to be a lot of overlap between what we talked about the last couple weeks and what we have here for today. So we'll jump right in. So our objectives is for the learner to identify the sensitivity and specificity of the point of care ultrasound upper extremity venous, differentiate a traditional sonographic upper extremity venous from a point of care upper extremity venous, describe the venous anatomy included in our point of care upper extremity venuses and the ultrasound appearance of each vessel, define the differences between the continuous compression point of care approach and a more limited exam, and then name the limitations and benefits of these exams. So indications for an upper extremity venous studies, um, they're going to be very similar to what we talked about with our lower extremity. So um, the idea that the patient has a thrombus, possibly a thrombus that has um, embolized, gotten lodged in the vessels of the lungs and resulted in a pulmonary emboli. So some of the things that are going to indicate that there could be a thrombus there would be anything that puts the patient at risk for Virchow's triad. So remember, Virchow's triad is stasis of blood, hypercoagulability, and recent trauma. So any of those three things, if the patient is fitting um, that criteria, uh, the practitioner may be concerned about an upper extremity thrombus if the particular um, signs of a thrombus are in the arm. Also, a patient that has thrown a clot that has become dislodged and turned into a pulmonary emboli will then be experiencing dyspnea. Um, they can have swelling, redness of the arm. Any of those things would be good indications for an upper extremity venous. Another newer consideration or different consideration, I should say, than we have with our lower extremity venous is that our arms and our very proximal vessels um, are, are often catheterized these days. And so that venous catheter placement really contributes to trauma. Um, sometimes those catheters are left indwelling for some period of time. And so those will put a patient at higher risk of uh, thrombus as well. And then another um, group of patients that are gonna be at higher risk or that can be evaluated through our upper extremity venous study we're not going to focus on this a lot today, but just know that this is a consideration in a way that we can um, actually utilize ultrasound is to evaluate hemodialysis access patency. So you can look at the stents put in um, to allow for hemodialysis access and identify if there's any clots around that, um, uh, that trauma, that area of trauma. And then finally, and this really isn't probably something that you'll be taking on as a, a, port as a point of care exam, but um, ultrasound of the upper extremity can be used for post-op or for venous mapping, um, mapping the veins, uh, just demonstrating where they are located, if there's any collaterals, how they're functioning, um, all of that would be part of that exam. But for today, we're going to keep it simple. Um, it's not an easy exam to complete, so um, we want you really comfortable with the protocol, and then you'll want to start going ahead and getting just practice in so that when you need this exam, um, you're ready to go, you have the confidence and the ability to complete it effectively. So that being said, for this particular lecture, we're really going to focus on just ultimately looking for and um, standardizing our protocol for an upper extremity DVT or even um, a superficial DV, uh, venous thrombosis as well. So let's get to so some of the considerations for the upper extremity as it kind of um, differentiates itself from the lower extremity is that the upper extremity DVT is pretty uncommon. However, um, it's kind of in some areas assumed that it's just completely unlikely to have an upper extremity DVT, which is kind of a false assumption. So while upper extremity DVTs only have about a third of the risk of lower extremity DVTs um, have to cause a pulmonary embolism, they still have a significant risk. So um, one of the things that a physician needs to be looking at is, you know, the, the, the state of the arm, the patient's risk factors, and are they demonstrating um, symptoms of a pulmonary embolism. So we know that an upper extremity DVT has a pretty um, significant association with repetitive activity. This repetitive activity DVT is known as Paget-Schroeder syndrome, 
This is where a, a patient that has had very continuous repetitive movement, usually of the shoulder region, will experience microtrauma to the tunica intima within the axillary vessel or subclavian vessel, um, and that will start that thrombolytic, or pardon me, that um, thrombus developing uh, cascade. So these particular patients may develop trauma from the motion, that trauma will result in clotting and a DVT of the axillary region. So um, there can also be a DVT association with anatomic anomalies of the thoracic outlet. So thoracic outlet obstruction is not completely uncommon. Um, this can be where it can happen in especially weight lifters or people that are very active where their pectoral muscles will really um, become hypertrophic. And because of those, pe those pectoral changes, um, it can actually compress the... Um, the subclavian vein underneath the clavicle. And when that starts to occur, it's going to make the blood flow in that subclavian vein more static and can lead to then that static of blood creating a clot. Now, this isn't always just in your bodybuilder group. This can happen just with um, people with some kind of just different anatomy. So those anatomic anomalies, whether they be natural or something that has developed because of activity, um, anybody with thoracic outlet syndrome may have some higher risk of having an upper extremity DVT. Then like I mentioned before, trauma from central venous catheters. We know that um, central venous catheters are now very common. Um, they provide many different benefits, um, but one of the groups of people that tend to have a lot of central venous catheters placed are going to be patients that are cancer patients and they need a pick line or something to deliver their, um, their chemotherapy with easy access. Well, those patients that already have cancer are going to be at a hypercoagulable state, number one, just from the cancer. Then number two, we're going to provide trauma to that vein to, put, to place the central venous catheter. So those two things together really have proven in a number of different studies that they can create or cause that patient to have an over 1,000 time increase in the risk of upper extremity DVT than your patient that is neither hypercoagulable and doesn't have an indwelling catheter. So as the um, number of these catheters are placed has increased, we notice that they're that they're finding a lot more DVT. You know, the some of the data is still out on this, but even if the 1,000 times increase is not 100% accurate, accurate, we can still assume that it does have a significant impact on the number of these cases that we're going to or currently seeing. So, um, additional complications that can increase the risk of DVTs of the upper extremity even further, like I mentioned, would be that peripheral inserted catheter or pick lines, um, subclavian venipuncture for different reasons, improper positioning of a catheter. So if you leave an indwelling catheter, the tip of that catheter should, um, if it was inserted through the jugular or subclavian or something like that, it should um, have the tip of that catheter in the superior vena cava just proximal to the um, right atria. If they've placed it from, you know, inferiorly and it's come up the inferior vena cava, the tip of that catheter should go right um, at the cavo, uh, excuse me, I put arterial, um, it should be uh, atrial, at the uh, cavo atrial area. So if they're missing that point, then patients seem to be more likely to create a thrombus around that area. And then a patient that has a history of a DVT. If they have a history of a DVT, that could indicate that they are actually hypercoagulable for some reason. So that history, again, puts them at higher risk, just like a malignancy would, just like stasis would, because all of those contribute to, um, you know, one of those components of Virchow's triad. So, um, so in review, really quickly here, we have that increased risk of DVT or even superficial clot in the upper arm. Um, the risk is gaining uh, is getting more and more common because of the increased number of indwelling catheters that are being placed in that region. And then if a patient has additional factors such as hypercoagulability through malignancy or through genetic disease or something else or stasis um, because of some sort of obstruction, that risk factor is going to go up um, exponentially. 
So um, if we look at where the studies have shown that most DVTs in the upper extremity are going to occur at, the majority of them are going to be in the brachial vein. Um, after that, we have the axillary vein, and then finally the last 5% is going to be in the subclavian vein. Now, just to give you a heads up, the subclavian is going to be the more, most difficult vein to evaluate typically during the study because of its position posterior to the clavicle. So because of that limit, um, that position, we're unable to compress the subclavian vein well in most cases, and so it's a little bit more difficult to really assess whether there is a thrombus in there or not. So fortunately, that is not our most common area to have um, a DVT of the upper extremity, but it is one of, of considerable concern still. So when we look back and um, if, if we do find one of these, what are they recommending treatment as? And back in 2016, treatment was suggested by the um, American College of Chest Physicians, and they actually um, indicated that they would uh, suggest that you utilize anticoagulant therapy without any thrombolytics, um, especially if it was the clot was noted in the axillary veins or proximal, so meaning axillary subclavian uh, brachycephalic. Now, technically, venography where you'd inject contrast and evaluate for, you know, any displacement of blood flow. Technically, that venography is still the gold standard. However, we're seeing these upper extremity venuses um, done in ultrasound more and more often. Now, if an upper extremity venous is done by a skilled practitioner, it again has this 96% um, specificity and a 97% sensitivity. The issue with this is comes in when it, we talk about the skilled practitioner. So where this is a newer study that they're using more and more, and there's not as much data here as there is for the DVT, sometimes we can be limited by the number of skilled practitioners available. So you, as a point of care provider, um, We'll have to, you know, practice this, understand this, practice this um, many times until you get to that level where you'll be at that top um, level to identify the highest with the highest specificity and sensitivity. Same thing can happen when in a general ultrasound department. Um, again, not every sonographer is a skilled um, skilled at upper extremity DVTs, so the the exam is only as good as the person providing it. There is a significant difference as well in the exam between what would be done in an imaging department where they're going to really evaluate the upper extremity venous system with, you know, the B mode in long, the B mode in transverse, with and without compression, and then go back and look at it in long with color and in long with spectral and possibly doing some res um, respirations and some augments and different things. So it's going to be a much more intense exam within an imaging department, and yet they still find that the point of care approach still has a pretty good um, uh, results. So it's definitely something that's worthwhile to, to learn about and determine if that's something that you want to add to your repertoire. Look at the anatomy of the upper extremity. We're going to have deep and superficial veins, and the deep veins um, that we look at in the legs for the thrombus, we really kind of ignore the superficial, but in the upper extremity, we're going to pay attention with that superficial because those are a little bit more likely in the upper extremity to throw a thrombus or extend into a deep vein than they are in the lower extremity. So the deep veins, we can tell um, they are deep veins because they're typically paired with arteries of a similar name. So the, you know, the brachial artery follow is paired with two separate uh, brachial veins and, and so on. The superficial have no accompanying arteries and the vessels that fall into that category would be the cephalic, basilic, median, and median cubital veins. And like I said, they can embolize into a serious thrombus. So we do go ahead and look at those during some of our, during our scans. If we look at the map of the venous system, Following it from distal to proximal as the blood would flow, you would see that. So here we're seeing, we're going to uh, follow the flow of the blood from the distal end here. We have the radial vein that is going to be on the lateral side of this patient that's in anatomic position. And then we have the ulnar vein that's going to follow the ulna on the ulnar side. Um, they are going to go ahead and communicate a couple times as they move up the arm until they really have a large communication there at the median cubital vein. So as they work their way up the arm, these are going to be your uh, deep veins of the forearm. That median cubital vein is for communication, and that is considered a superficial vein. 
as it uh, ascends, um, after that medial cubital vein, it's going to go medially in the arm up as the basilic vein until it reaches an area that is going to actually um, join with the brachial vein and then with the cephalic vein. And as it does that, it's going to create anastomose and become the axillary vein. Then the axillary vein is going to continue up until it crosses the lateral margin of the first rib, and then we refer to it as the subclavian vein. The subclavian transverses towards the heart, and when the uh, external jugular, internal jugular are going to anastomose, and they are going to come together, enter with that subclavian vein, and then that's going to produce the superior vena cave, or brachiocephalic, excuse me. And then as the brachiocephalic from both sides come together, then we have our superior vena cava. a vein and an artery. When you're um, planning to do an upper extremity venous, you got to, again, start with uh, the highest frequency transducer that you can get the adequate penetration with, like we did with the lower extremity. This will typically be your 8 to 12. But as we're working sometimes with an obese patient or somebody that has extreme edema, you don't be... Um, don't be opposed to moving to a curvilinear or maybe a vector or sector to get additional penetration. Another consideration is as you get closer and closer in the area like of the subclavian where the subclavian anastomosis with the jugulars and becomes a brachiocephalic, that area of anastomosis is really posterior and inferior to the clavicle, so it can be really challenging to evaluate. So sometimes finding a transducer with a very uh, small footprint as I mentioned, a vector or sector that would not have that linear appearance, what would be more square, that will give you a better footprint so that you can kind of um, apply pressure superior to the clavicle, angling inferior into the body. It will also provide you better penetration, and so you may be able to, if not evaluate the veins as well, at least put some color on them and to um, take a look at their patency. Other key points to remember are that arteries are rounder than veins. They do not compress. If you're able to compress around an artery so it's no longer round, you're pressing too hard. Uh, we also, if we're having difficulty evaluating whether an artery is a vein or a vein is an artery, we can always use um, color and spectral Doppler to look for the waveform patterns to determine um, which of the, whether it be venous or arterial. Veins, of course, are more oval. They're very compressible because that um, less in the uh, thickness of the tunica media, and then they're going to demonstrate phasic flow on color Doppler. Now, it's a little bit different in the veins of the arm in that, um, especially as you're working in the veins closer to the heart, you're going to get some reflection of the pulsatility of the heart into those veins where you don't see that in the lower extremity system. So you'll see a mostly phasic pattern, but you might see signals of pulsatility. Don't be concerned that you're in an artery. Just be aware that um, because of its close proximity, especially in the brachiocephalic, maybe subclavian veins, um, you're getting some reverberation back from that right atria every time it goes through the um, cardiac contraction process. If you're doing an area where you can complete compressions, you should only be doing those in transverse because remember, a long vein will roll away from the transducer. You'll think you have it compressed and you actually don't. So the only way to ensure that you have full compression is to do it in transverse. With the upper extremity, um, they suggest that both sides, affected and unaffected, be evaluated. And we know that the point of care POCUS ultrasound is limited to B-mode exam, but can be enhanced by use of color and spectral. Whereas a traditional ultra, ultrasound, upper extremity ultrasound DVT study done in a sonographic suite might would most likely include color, or pardon me, B-mode color and Doppler um, for a more complete approach. We also know that development of collaterals would indicate that there's a missed DVT. So if you're seeing a whole lot of veins that you wouldn't expect, don't they seem anomalous to the anatomy, then um, you have to be suspicious that there is an, uh, possibly a downstream or a lateral DVT in which caused an increase in pressure in that distal venous system that then um, caused it to create collaterals to bypass that DVT. Obviously, that's not going to happen in an acute case, but somebody that has had a chronic DVT, that's something you can see. 
And then as you finally prepare to do the exam, you're going to have your patient's head slightly elevated and you're going to have the arm rotated into an um, anatomic position and then abducted away from the body so that you really have good access to that axial brachial region. So what should we do for a POCUS exam protocol of the upper extremity? We, just like we do with the venous of the lower extremity, veins should be compressed in intermittent compression every one to two centimeters in order to uh, evaluate their, the presence of thrombus. Now, in certain veins, um, we do with and without compression would include when you're starting your protocol, you often want to start in the patient's neck because those are going to be tributaries to those uh, upper extremity veins. It's when they come together with that subclavian. So um, we can compress from the, the cranial end towards the caudal end of the interner, in, excuse me, internal jugular vein and follow that jugular vein with one to two centimeters compression from its distal location all the way down to its anastomosis with the subclavian. Now, at this point, this can be an area that can be challenging to image, again, as I mentioned, because it has such a significant um, posterior deep location to the clavicle. So here you can see um, the um, interior jugular, internal jugular vein running right next to the common carotid artery, easily flexible, compressible in the neck. As you follow it down, you will see that um, as it goes to reach uh, anastomosis with the subclavian vein, um, sometimes, like I said, you're going to have to use that small uh, footprint transducer angle down, and at that point, you might lose the ability to compress. The subclavian vein then is going to be difficult to compress because of its location just posterior to the clavicle. So once you get to the subclavian here, um, you're really going to be adjusting your gain samples and making sure that you are getting a nice vessel, turning that gain up high, and then backing it off, turning it so it gets darker and darker until you know you're, um, you've gotten rid of all of your artifacts. If you're still unsure if there could be possibly a, a thrombus in there after evaluating it in long B mode, it's a great idea to go ahead and add some color to it. And if you can get that color to, to accurately fill the vein, then you'll know that it's, um, that it's open, not obstructed with the thrombus. Beware of that with, with your color. You don't want to have artifactual color making the vein appear normal. So you're going to turn your color up as high as you can and then again back it off just like you did with your regular vein until it fills the vein with color or you detect that there is some disruption of the color within the vein. Once you get the IVC to the subclavian vein, some people will like to evaluate with color the brachiocephalic vein as it dumps in, um, towards the superior vena cava. Um, as part of a limited POCUS exam, that might not necessarily be um, imaging you're choosing to do as it is a little bit more challenging in that area um, and can be time consuming. So in this particular case, you would then follow that subclavian down, making sure the entire subclavian is open in long with, with your gain set precisely and using color if you're unsure of thrombus or not. As you get to the distal end of the first rib, you will see the, the area where that subclavian vein is going to now be referred to as the axial vein. And you'll follow that axial vein again. Now, now you can go to back, back to transverse since you're not fighting with the clavicle anymore. And you're going to compress that axillary vein through the axilla region of the arm until you reach the brachial vein. Okay, so at this point, you have assessed that internal jugular vein in transverse with every a, a compression every one to two centimeters until you saw it anastomose with that subclavian. And here you can evaluate the subclavian. Most likely um, you won't be able to compress this, so you're going to have to evaluate it in long with very optimal um, gain settings. And if you're unable to de determine the presence or absence of a thrombus, then you're going to utilize color. And you can, if you ch so choose, um, watch that color as it goes into the brachiocephalic vein. This, again, is one of the hardest regions you're going to have in the exam because of its location compared to the clavicle, making it so difficult to access this. As you follow the subclavian, you're going to get to the lateral margin of the first rib. And at that point is when you're going to see the cephalic vein come off, 
as well as the axillary vein bifurcate, or what we should think about as actually anastomose here, um, at the basilic and the brachial. Now, sometimes you can actually follow the basilic and the brachial together if they're closely related. You might be able to follow and compress them one to, every one to two centimeters and keep them both on your monitor the whole time. Other times, um, you might have to follow one with compressions all the way down to the antecubital space and then go back and follow the other all the way down to the antecubital space. After that, you're going to go back up to your subclavian. You're going to identify where the anastomosis is with the cephalic vein. This is going to be more laterally in the shoulder. So you're going to follow this cephalic vein down. Now, the cephalic vein is a superficial vein. So if you can look at the image right here, it's not going to be accompanied by an artery. It's going to be very superficial, and it can actually easily be compressed without intending to. So just the weight of your hand and the weight of the transducer can often compress this vein. So if you think, oh, they don't have a cephalic vein, try releasing some pressure, adding a bunch of gel kind of as a standoff so you're not tempted to push harder than necessary and that you can keep that vein open to follow it with those compressions every one to two centimeters. So after we've followed all of the humeral region um, veins down, there, we're going to see a lot of connections here in the antecubital space, basically mostly through the median uh, cubital vein. So at a lot, a lot of the time, a uh, point of care ultrasound um, would be completed at this point. So um, a practitioner may choose to move forward if the forearm were very symptomatic, but because these veins are rather small, um, lots of practitioners will choose to stop the study at this point. If you did choose to um, follow the veins through the forearm, you would simply continue on your compressions through the cephalic vein all the way to the forearm, which is going to basically um, uh, get very, very small as it gets towards the digits. Then you can find the radial and the ulnar veins and you can compress them following them back up until they reach the medium cubital and then you've really covered all of the venous anatomy. Now that is the B mode POCUS exam, the most basic. Um, if you chose, if you had any additional questions, remember that you have those tools of your color, your Doppler, and those can all be implemented to help provide information that would support your exam findings. If you are recording images, um, you know, for documentation, the best regions to take these images are at are going to be at areas of anastomosis because that's most likely where thrombus is going to appear first. So um, after completing the study or while you're completing the study, you may want to save and document images with and without compression at the internal jugular vein subclavian anastomosis through the general axillary region where we see the brachial and basilic anastomosis and at the cephalic axillary as anastomosis. And so this would provide you pretty reasonable documentation. You can always take a few more images. The thing you don't typically want to get in the habit of is, I've heard people describe it as, um, you know, in, in the ultrasound world, we say we're ultrasound text, not CT text. We don't need an image every millimeter. So um, as a physician or practitioner, you're welcome to do whatever you want, but these files can get rather large and then they can be very slow to transmit. So by planning your, um, your images carefully, keeps the file a nicer size, makes it easier to deal with. You can always add images um, down through the forearm if you so choose, and you just basically follow this pattern where you um, image at the anastomosis areas. Additional images to consider, you can always, if you're a little bit uncertain of your findings with your B-mode transverse images, then you can always assess, um, take additional images and view the veins in long. You can add color and view those veins in long with color, looking for any deviation um, patterns of the color that would indicate a, a, a thrombus affecting di or disturbing the blood flow. And then you can also do assessment of the veins with a spectral Doppler and looking for that phasicity that we expect um, from a good open vein. And then as we talked about um, in previous lectures, that's where you can add in augmentation, um, you can add in um, a SNP test that we're going to talk about, and some other things that might help add to your um, to your diagnostic powers. Okay, 
So notes regarding color and spectral in the upper DVT study. These are a little bit different piece than the lower extremity venuses. So color and Doppler can assess for phasicity and pulsatility. And as I mentioned, where we don't usually expect pulsatility in a vein because of its location and pro proximity to the heart, um, it's not alarming if you see that, especially if you have a pa patient with some congestive heart failure um, or really hypertensive, you're going to get more reverberation back from that um, from that heart than you would otherwise. So um, it's something that you're not necessarily going to be alarmed about, especially as you get towards the subclavian and axillary, and, or excuse me, subclavian and uh, brachiocephalic veins. So one way we can assess um, is with distal augment, as I mentioned. So in this particular image, they're in the left axillary vein, and they're seeing this pulsatility with each of these beats, and then they're seeing phasicity with each breath. So if they wanted to see if there was an occlusion of the axial artery distal to where they're taking this sample, um, they would compress distally, and they would see an, an increase in flow or a rush of flow uh, in the region where, they comp um, where they're sampling. That would indicate that that vein was open from their area of compression to the area of sample. Now, because of all the anastomosis up in the axi axillary region, it doesn't mean that um, it can sometimes just uh, show that there's been blood flow from a different vein than the one that you're actually studying. And so that's why sometimes that's one of the reasons that's used a little bit less efficiently in the arm. Um, we can also assist in evaluation with non-compressible veins like brachiocephalic and subclavian by adding color. So if we can't compress, then we can add color and look for full lumen flow, which would indicate that there was no, um, no divergence or no disruption of the flow caused by a thrombus. Another thing that we can use is called the sniff maneuver. And when you sniff quickly, what happens is, as you know, your thoracic pressure is going to immediately decrease. And so you'll have this immediate, your diaphragm drops, you end up with this low thoracic pressure for a moment. And because it's so low, it will cause blood to rush forward toward the heart. And so with this, you're really, if I was to be taking an axillary sample like we are here, and I had my patient sniff, theoretically, you should see a rush of blood towards the heart. Now, this is going to be most effective in those veins that you can't compress, such as the subclavian and the brachiocephalic. So that's where we see this used most often, and that's called the sniff test. So kind of like we did with the legs, we used um, distal augment to push blood forward, and then we used a sniff test rather than a valsalva in this case to see what's ahead. Now, you find a thrombus, it's going to look like a thrombus anywhere else. We know that thrombus are going to have... Um, acute, um, subacute, and chronic phases. In each of those phases, they'll have a different appearance. Thrombus are most often going to be um, at those valves and in anastomosis regions, and so that's one of the reasons we have you take um, documentation images at, the, at that area. So here's a pretty typical th thrombus. This one is actually in the leg, but I was just using it because it was such a nice demonstration of what a, of what a subacute thrombus may look like. So a very acute or new thrombus, it is going to be rather hypoechoic, but it will have some low-level echoes, and that's why it's so important to have your gain settings um, set properly. And then in the subacute phase, it's going to organize and begin to thrombus and become more solid, and so you'll see it look something like this. And then as it goes into chronic, you will see if, um, if it's... Uh, breaking this clot down, you'll see areas of necrosis that will appear hypoechoic, so they may even be entering more of a chronic phase here. Um, it will become more complex in nature, and if the body does its whole process, it will break this down until this thrombus is completely gone. If the body cannot complete that process, um, what this will do is basically become very echogenic, shrivel, and it can actually cause the vein to basically collapse around it. And in that particular case, then hopefully the body would build collaterals to bypass this issue. So when we have a thrombus, it's going to look something like this, and we're not going to be able to compress it. And then we're going to assess how long it's been there based off of the echogenicity.
So in summary, point of care ultrasound upper extremity venous studies have a high sensitivity for DVT. They can be done relatively quickly while maintaining good quality. They're often considered more challenging than the lower extremity DVT, so, so exam practice is essential. They're not as thorough as a standard sonographic ultrasound examination, um, but if you're um, trying to get a quick diagnosis and move on, or you just want to eliminate the op possibility, then this might be a great option for you. It interrogates the vein from the brachycephalic to just beyond the elbow region. However, um, as a practitioner, it's always at your uh, discretion to go a little bit farther into that ulnar and re uh, radial region as well. So I hope that you will have your transducer and get, um, get started with some of these and hopefully you enjoy doing them and develop uh, an overall sense of confidence in these. So thank you so much for joining me and we'll see you next time.